Lord, to our hearts. Lord Jesus, we are open books, with open books. And uh, the things that you want to say to us tonight, we're, we're ready to hear. The things that you want to teach us today, um, God, even the things that we want, that we reject. God, would you please, um, may our spirit receive it and process it. May our lives be changed that, that in the end um, of this walk, of this life when, our, when our, our breath is no more and our heart beats its last. The reality of heaven would remove any fear from us. The truth of your word would cut through the lies of this world and we would um, truly be transformed from glory to glory. Teach us your word, Holy Spirit. We cannot do it without you. No human thought will ever um, will ever suffice. We want to be like those people that were on the road to Emmaus. Today, we want to say to ourselves, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us about the scriptures? All of us desire this for the glory of your kingdom, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. The book of Luke, we start a new book. It's the second in, um, the, of the four Gospels. If you're new to scripture, Bear with the, um, if you're not new to scripture, bear with those who might know a little less. Let's just go, if a brief overview. You have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the Jewish Bible. The New Testament is, is, the, um, is all the promises that were given in the Old Testament coming to pass. The first four books are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have letters which were written to the churches for instruction and correction. And then you have the book of Revelation, which is the, of, uh, a t foretelling of the end times. The man that wrote the book of Luke was a doctor. His name was Luke. He also happens to be uh, responsible for writing the book of Acts. So between the book of Luke and Acts, he's responsible for, for writing you know, more of the New Testament than, than any writer, even, even the apostle Paul uh, unless you give him credit for writing the book Hebrews, and then there's just a whole lot. Now, keep in mind that Luke was also a Gentile. He was Greek. He was non-Jew. And it's kind of a, a funny thing. Like in our day and age here, you don't think as, of Christians as, as, as Jews, but back then you only thought of them as Jews. In our day and age, you have, if you ever talk to somebody who's Jewish, anybody who's Israeli, anybody who's Hebrew, and you tell them you go to church, and they go, oh, you go to church, well, I'm Jewish. Like, what does that mean? You know, to tell me, that, what, is that a retort that you just learned how to say because so many people had talked to you before? But back then, it was thought to be only a Jewish belief. That's why um, you'll see that is very distinctive for what's written to Jews and what's written to uh, what the Hebrews would call a goy or a Greek. So the question asks then, if you're new to Scripture, why are we reading the Bible? Is it some kind of information that we need to gather and to glean? What is it about the Bible that we should read it? We know the stories. Everybody knows the story. Even people that are outside. I mean, the first people to tell you about the Lord Jesus is people out there who are going to tell you how you're not acting like him as they're so sure they know him. You follow what I'm saying? Let's read, and I'll answer these questions and more. The first four verses. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, O most excellent Theolophus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Please give me your attention. It is thought that Theolophus was Luke's master. Luke's master. You see, 
in our day and age, a doctor is looked upon, revered, paid well. We look at them and we give them this amazing honor. Back then, doctors were mostly slaves who were servants of governors, of wealthy people. They were slaves. They were indentured servants to do this thing. And it's thought that Theolophus was one of these slaves. Some scholars, though, would suggest because of the word Theophilus, the two words combined, which in, in our language means lover of God, that it is written to anybody who loves God, but what kind of shoots that down is because he says, oh, most excellent. The word most excellent, it, it, is, it is a title. It's like saying, oh, great one, um, high and mighty one, uh, reverend type of thing. You understand what I'm saying, guys? Okay, just giving you a background here. We'll get to it. So Paul, I'm sorry, Luke, writing to Theolophus or Theophilus, however you want to pronounce it, is saying, hey, all these things that I had spoke to you about, all these little narratives, all these little stories, all these things that I told you, I'm going to write them down for you now in great detail because I believe the Holy Spirit has so led me to do this. And I want you to know that these things that I've told you, they're true and they're real. That is the first part of today's lesson, I believe, that I think that we must understand. The things that we're reading, guys, in the Bible, they're real. I think we forget that because so many times we read uh, a book and it's a story. We watch a movie and it's make-believe. This is real. These people existed some 2,000 years ago. They walked the face of the earth and ready? Their life was changed by Jesus Christ. In our day and age, we have this crazy thing. We, we, um, we meet somebody who might be a Christian. They invite us to church. We come to church, and it's a, it's a fun place of peace. Maybe the people there are very nice to you, unlike the people at work or the people in your family, and you start going to church. But there's a crazy thing that happens, or should I say that doesn't happen, and that is that your life is not transformed by the power of God. In which case, you've missed something really, really important. Because the idea isn't to show up to church so you can experience some peace. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and it bears witness again because of what we're going to talk about. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. What did I miss again? Gentleness. Gentleness. I hate that one. I always miss that one. I'm teasing. Now, I want you to know that those things are the things that cannot be forced. They can be faked, but not forced. Here's what I mean. Speaking of my own life, because speaking of your life would be rude, and I know many of your lives, but speaking of my own life, go back some 25 years ago, before I knew the Lord, I was uncontrollably lustful uncontrollably violent, uncontrollably wrathful, uncontrollably many things, uncontrollably. Now, when I first started going to church, me and my wife, at the time being my girlfriend, we started going to the church. It was a, it was a Wednesday, it was, I'm sorry, it was a Sunday night at 7 o'clock, and my pastor, at the time, I didn't know he was going to be my pastor, he was teaching the book of Psalms which is songs and poems you all might know. Now, as he was teaching that, I would show up to church and there would be this pseudo-peace that I felt. The people seemed nice and, get this, if you will, intimidated by me. And that immediately made me think, since they're intimidated by me, they should be. And there was this weird kind of 
prideful arrogance that I walked in there. That's right, I don't belong here. Oh, yo, church people. I'm not one of you church people. Even though I'm in church, I'm not a church person. There was this superior, inferior thing going on. You follow what I'm saying? I was inferior, thus making me superior. You church, you're nice people with your fake old smiles. I know what goes on. And I kept coming back for that because truth is I didn't know why. But I had some strange attraction to that place. And if me and my wife missed a week or two, which is kind of a funny thing, at the point of my life, just a few years later, missing a week of church was like a tragedy. Baby, we didn't go to church last week. We got to get back to church. Back then, we'd miss a month or two. I don't know, the dog ran away. We used to go to my in-law's house. They used to live on the water in Pompano, and the church was maybe three or four miles away, right? So we used to go up there, and I used to take my dog up there. My dog would trash their house every single week. He'd buy a hole in their fence, have a fight with the neighbor's dog runner, something like that. And that was always the excuse, oh, I can't go to church this week. It was a month would go by, but I noticed there was something different about me when I didn't go to church. Now, here's the point I was trying to make. Later on, accepting Christ as my Savior, even though I was going to church for a number, I probably two years before I accepted Christ as my Savior. After accepting Christ as my Savior, some things he did like automatically. Like in my generation, we curse like truck drivers. And I'm talking about my mother. We just cussed a lot. That's what we did. You know, my mother and father both cursed a lot. And, you know, just, you know, we just, that's what we did. And the craziest thing happened. The day after I accepted the Lord Jesus as my Savior, every time I cursed, I felt like God was going to punish me. I'd be at work and I'd say, ah, blah, blah, blah. and then I'd go. <laughs> and I'd walk in my office and go, what was that? Now, I had the opportunity then to allow God to do that work in me. And even though you think that I might be a little bit edgy from the pulpit, I might say some words that you think I've never heard that from the pulpit. Believe it or not, that's all I say. I don't say anything else. I haven't cussed in 20 years. I just don't do it. It's just not my thing. God took that from me miraculously. What are you shaking your head back there for, boy? Yeah, what are you shaking your head for? What do, I, do I curse a lot at home or something? Well, I say the A word every once in a while as a joke. Oh. There you go. Don't preach in front of your family. They'll straighten you right out. You should have lived in my house. When I was your age, we couldn't eat unless we said A twice. Yeah, thank you. Um, but there were some things that God left. There were some things he left. And, and, and he, with those things that he left, guys, I found myself wondering if I was saved at all. I remember thinking, okay, well, God took away that cussing, and, and he didn't do it in, like, some supernatural, like, boom, all of a sudden. It's like when I did it, when I cussed or said something foul, there would be this feeling like God was going to punish me if I did it again. And that was the, the, the uh, conviction of God falling upon my heart for the first time. So if some of you guys that are new in the faith are finding this weird feeling when you do things that you shouldn't do, that's called conviction. Now, you can harden your heart to it and keep doing it. It's very easy. I could cuss anytime I want. It's not like I can't. I just don't like it. It's just a weird thing God took away. But there was yet some stuff that he left with me that I still did and I didn't feel bad about. Still extremely violent. We could scrap. No problem. No big deal. I'll never forget I had um, been just a couple of years old in the Lord. I'm telling this story for a very specific reason. I want you guys to be able to relate to that. I want... I want these things to comfort you. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. It was um, just about 
a year and a half, two years into my walk with the Lord, I had gone to prison in 1997. I had gotten out, and I was walking into Home Depot. We were actually, funny thing, it was a Wednesday night. We were on our way to church. It's a shame my wife's not here. Um, I wanted to uh, amen this story. And uh, I had my daughter Arlie in my arms. She was about three years old at the time. Um, I was walking to Home Depot, and some guy was taking a leak behind this uh, pylon. And I walked by, and I said, very nice, very nice. And, and he stood up, and he, what? You got a problem? And he started, like, stumbling at me. And I had the kid in my hand, and I was walking, and he was making steps on me. And I seen him back at me. And then a Home Depot walker, a worker was there. And I immediately turned. I gave the kid to the Home Depot worker. I grabbed the guy, and I threw him on the ground. And I, I lurched back my arm. And, my, and I, saw, I looked back, and I saw my wife and kids in the car. And I was like, wow, I really shouldn't be doing this right now especially since I was on probation and I was probably going to wind up going back. But, you know, I didn't know what he was going to hit me from behind. I had the kid in my hand. I didn't know. So then all of a sudden, uh, I, I, I don't even remember. I think I let him go or something like that. And, and then I took my kid and I started walking around Home Depot and then I started hearing aisle 14, code four. <laughs> and I looked up and I was in aisle 14 and I was like, ah. <laughs> so now I'm in aisle 12. Aisle 12, code four. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm nine. <laughs> and when I walked outside, there's like four cop cars there, and they're like, don't move. And I was like, oh, I just got out. I don't want to go back. And some things, like I said, God had left with me. And the evidence to myself lying evidence to myself was I'm not saved at all. There's nothing changed about me. I was just as easy for me to throw him down and pummel him as it was before I accepted the Lord. And I had to come up with this calculation. I had to come to this thing, you know, just to tell you the end of the story, the guy got a, a citation, a couple of workers that were in Home Depot verified my story and, and, uh, and I, we, we left. And I said, you know, from now on, we're going to church. <laughs> we're not stopping at Home Depot on the way. <laughs> we're going to be in church every Wednesday night. We ain't missing. And I'll never forget, because, and I don't know why I remember all this stuff, but I remember we had missed a few weeks of church. And like I said, back then it was just easy. A couple weeks just went by, and it just, you guys know what I mean? It just seemed to pass. But when we got serious and ready, we got involved in people's lives. I couldn't miss anymore because there was people there that were counting on me praying for them. And I was counting on people praying for me. I was talking to somebody about what was going on with their son or daughter. I was talking to somebody about what was happening with my relationship, my wife. You know, there was always these things that when you are connected, you miss them. But when you're just coming and going, coming and going, a month can go by and oh well. You follow what I'm saying? About a year after that, goodness no, it was about six months before. Baby, when did we go up to Jupiter and have that and that with them that thing with the cops up there? Was that before I went away or after I went away? No, I think it was before. You're right. I think it was before I went away. So me and my wife decide before I, I leave for prison, and now that we're both walking with the Lord and, and we're, we're trying to work this, this situation out, we, we want to work on our marriage because our marriage was so much a part of just take care of the kids, you know? You do this, I do this. And, but we, we finally, after Christ, decided, you know what? This is going to start to mean something to me now. It's going to mean to you I'm sorry, it's going to mean to me what it's always meant to you. I now pledge you my life. In Christ, I want to be a husband. I had not been a husband. I had been a boyfriend. You, you following me, guys? And we decided to take a weekend. Uh, it was about, I want to say it was about a month and a half or two months before I had to report. Um, and... We were unpacking the car in the parking lot. Uh, we were in Juneau Beach, 
and there was a, a guy on a moped or something driving up and down. It was just starting to get dark out. It was just kind of twilight. And there's a guy, and as my wife was emptying the car out, I saw these headlights go on and off and on and off and high and bright and high and bright. And I get out of the car and I look, and I, like I said, it's dark and I'm seeing this light. And I'm like, can I help you with something? You know, you want something? And this guy pulls up and is this kind of a, a, a poindexterish, white, dweeby kind of guy. And he looks at me and he goes, are you scared of me? <laughs> and I said, you're going to have a better day. You're going to keep driving and just go. And now, I guess I had a baggy shirt on or something. And he said to me, do you have a gun? And I said, yeah, I got a gun. Run away now. Get out of here. Now, I was just completely joking with the guy. I didn't have a gun. But he then drives away. And I was like, well, that's over. Thank goodness for that. And then he's at the door of the hotel as we're pulling up. And the woman behind the counter, she's got the phone in her hand. And she looks up at me and she goes. <laughs> and I go, hi. I have the police on the phone. And I said, I'll talk to them if you like. And I started to go, yeah, there's this really weird dude in the parking lot here. And then all of a sudden I hear, freeze, don't move. And I turn around, and there's four cops at the door, all guns drawn like this. And now I'm just like, easy, guys. Settle down. And I'm looking past them. My wife is just walking into the hotel looking at me going, only my life. You remember that, baby? So now I'm like, now I can only, now right's going through my head is, he must have went up and told the people at the desk that I had a gun, there was some guy robbing him or something. So I got four cops drawn down on me, and they're drawn down. They're not like, freeze, don't, they're, they're all like, I was like, relax, please. Let's, it's, I just go, so belly on the floor, hands behind the back, knee in the neck, there it is, that's the one. They, and I explained to them the situation. The guy, apparently he's some crazy peeper from around the neighborhood, and, and the cop was like apologetic. I was like, no, it's, uh, it's what I've become accustomed to, actually. And it just seems like the more you try to do what's right, the worse things get. As that movie, The Godfather 3, <laughs> just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. But when the fruit of the Spirit, but when true salvation occurs, the evidence of your changed life is no longer what you can force or fake. It becomes now the fruit, love, and joy, and peace, and patience. Yes, even gentleness. These things you can't fake, guys. They are the overflow of your life. Now, what overflow might I be speaking of is this. The Word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces the division of your bones and your marrows and discerns the thought and intent of your heart, Hebrews 4. I'm telling you now, the reason we go about to read, the reason Luke was telling Theolophus, here are the things that happened, is because Christian if you want to experience the things in your life and you're not reading the Bible every day, it ain't going to happen. Let me explain it to you like this. I bet there are some men and some women in here who have Olympic athletes locked up inside them. I'm telling you, world-class athletes inside your body. It's in your genes. You have the strength, the ability to be strong. I bet there's some of you guys in here that inside of you is this power. And you never knew it. 
because you never tried. You never went to running. You never went to lifting. You never went to compete in anything. You let the fears of your mind or the distractions of your life, you let whatever it was, it was never unlocked, even though that power was in you. Some of you guys understand where I'm going. Now, the difference between the physical and the spiritual is this, and you might bear witness, I had no power over lust. I had no power over wrath. I had no power over sloth. I had no power over these things in my life. Zero. There was, I was powerless. I had said to God, I had said to God, rescue this woman from me because I am so bad to her. I have promised her to be faithful. I have promised her to be loyal. I have made her promise after promise after promise. And I have broken all of them, even though I promised you. I promised myself. Rescue her from me, I prayed. Anybody understand? Amen. Well, then I got saved. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. God, the Bible says, filled me with his Holy Spirit, baptized me into the body of Christ. That power now to overcome those things, it's in me. But that doesn't mean I'm going to walk in that power. That power still has to be realized to its fullest potential. Do you understand what I'm saying? All of you here, if I took a poll and I said to you, okay, how many of you guys have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I guarantee the vast majority, almost all of you would say, I did. And I'd say to you then, how are you doing with greed, lust, pride, all these seven deadly temptation sins, so, so to speak, as they're called. And most of you would say, like me, not good. And then I'd say, well, let's figure out why. Because if, and now I'm quoting scripture, if the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, then why is it that we are not living like him? Right or wrong? Did anybody ever wonder that? I, anybody ever say to himself? Anybody ever look in the mirror and go, there's no way you're saved because of the things that you do are so horrible. Am I the only one who, who, who's so... The, the, there's a Bible verse in, in um, Matthew, I want to say four or five, where he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That mourning is not, oh, you have a broken heart, somebody died, you got sick. So, that's not that mourning. That mourning is somebody mourning their own sad state. I'm horrible. I am so bad. I promised myself I wasn't going to do this. I promised my wife I wasn't going to do this. I promised my family I wasn't going to do this. And here I am doing it over and over and over again. Anybody else? Or am I the only one? That's it, huh? Wow, you guys came to the wrong church. So how do we tap into that power so that we could overcome those things? Well, you have five ways in which you must exercise. In order to be a mixed martial artist, something I have a little bit of experience about, you must have five components that will balance out your life as a mixed martial artist. Number one, and in my opinion, the most important is wrestling. If you don't have the heart of a wrestler, you're gonna be very limited in your ability. Wrestling is not just training for the mat, for takedowns and things like that, but it is the heart. The heart of a wrestler, it's never, it's embracing the grind, it's moving forward, it's nonstop. Number two, again, and this is my opinion, jujitsu. At any point in time, you have to have the ability to be on the bottom and to take over the top, to be in a bad position and yet still submit your opponent. Are you with me? Three, boxing. You must know how to get out of the way of a punch. If somebody's throwing a punch at you and you go like this, you're going to get knocked out. When somebody throws a punch at you, you go like this or you go like this. You have to understand footwork that if you want to punch me in the face and I have to make you cross your body, you're going to lose power. So my footwork, without an understanding of boxing, 
at least even a little, forget it. Don't, don't even waste your time with mixed martial arts. And then there's Muay Thai or kickboxing. Knowing how to kick somebody properly without blowing out your own leg and putting your shin upon the side of their head so that you separate them from consciousness is extremely important if you want to be a mixed martial artist. And then the fifth thing and the component that you have most control over is conditioning. If you're not doing road work, if you're not hitting the elliptical, the, the, I mean, if you are not working your conditioning, that's the one thing that you can do better than your opponent. You can outwork your opponent. Those five things will make you a mixed martial artist. Dreaming about it's not going to help. Watching a lot of fights on TV is not going to help. Reading a book about Anderson Silva, jiu-jitsu, boxing, or any of those things, it's not going to help, right? Does that even sound logical to you guys that are not into mixed martial arts? Going to church is not going to make you a complete Christian. Listening to worship music is not going to make you a complete Christian. Listening to some sermon on the radio is not going to make you a complete Christian. You can change your lifestyle without changing your life. You'll be the same, and I use this word respectfully, you'll be the same pathetic person you were in the church as you were outside the church. Why am I saying it like that? Because I'm going to tell you the five things that you need to live this life to the fullest, to unlock the power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead again. The Bible says that lives inside of you. What are you doing with that? Are you arguing with somebody the finer points of Calvinism, Arminianism? What are you doing with the power that raised Christ from the dead? What did we look at last week? These things will follow those. Demons will be cast out. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up certain serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Does that not shock you? Does anybody read that and go, well, I'm a failure. Thank you very much, God. Or are we just revering the Bible so much that it now has become, there's my Bible. There it is. I read it. I read it once. I heard about that. I know. But you've got to understand that a lot of people have taken that to abuses. And there are these churches where they dance with snakes. So I don't want to be uh, one of those weirdos. But if you can look at those things and you've done none of them, none of them, then at some point in time, I realize you're not going to be held up to Scripture. I'm not, I mean, nobody's taking Scripture and saying, listen, if you're not following it, you're condemned. But some point in time, the Word of God's got to convict you and you've got to say, that's what I'm going to do. I am going to cast out demons. I'm going to lay my hands on the sick. The whole poisonous snake thing, okay, forget about that. There's your out. <laughs> so, here are the five things. First things first, number one, prayer. You got to spend time in prayer. I'm not talking about in the shower. I'm not talking about on your way to work in the car. I'm talking about you and God in the closet alone, bearing your heart, sharing your need, and saying, here I am, send me anywhere. Change my life Make it new, make it different. Far too many people on the outside think that God is not concerned with what's going on on the inside. I have this video out called The Fighting Pastor. This company came, you guys that have been part of the church, they came and they did this whole, I was at the time coaching some MMA fighters, and they did this whole story on my life. It was like a 15-minute, it's a cool video. They did an amazing job. It's from Vice. If you want to look it up, it's called Vice, the Fighting Passion. They did an amazing job. They didn't make us look like idiots. They filmed a little bit in the church respectfully. The comments that you see on YouTube, they are so atrocious. I have never seen hate and vitriol so venomous. 
And many of them were like, yeah, like God cares about who wins an MMA fight. Nice job, Christian. Even from other Christians, I'm a Christian and this guy's full of crap. You know, all this other stuff on there and you're like, wow, these people don't even know me. But the point that I'm trying to make is this. What is a fighter supposed to do if he wants to give his life to the Lord? Is he supposed to now leave fighting? What are you supposed to do? Let's say you're a bartender. Let's say we had a couple of people that used to deliver for Gold Coast, and they, they delivered beer, and they delivered wine and liquor, and they got saved. What are they supposed to do now? Oh, gee, Willikers, I, uh, I don't think God would like me uh, delivering beer to, to stores anymore, so I'll just quit my job and wait at home for God to do something. No. Pastor used to always say, bloom where you're planted. Let God move you in and move you out. Don't try to put God into our little American box and say, this is what God would have me to be, so I'm going to do that based upon what everybody's telling me I should or should not be. You follow me? It's heartbreaking. Prayer, Bible study, fellowship, worship, witnessing. There you five. Prayer, Bible study, fellowship. That's going to church, hanging out with Christians. I remember being a young Christian and realizing me and my wife realized, wow, we don't know any Christians. I started playing softball. As a matter of fact, Dean's sitting right there with me and him. was like my first, that's the first person that I ever prayed with outside church. Dean, one time we were sitting on his lawn right up the block here. He goes, hey, bro, let's pray before you go. And I was like, all right now? Yeah, man, we can pray. Well, all right, you know, how, how, stand up, Tony. And I was like, oh, well, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you do this? Do you, you hug when you pray? <laughs> you know, I don't know, how, do, do we do, how, what do we do with my hands and my head? I remember being so confused. We're supposed to pray. What, what, how, how do we do this? And he said, no, no, man, just give me your hand. Put your hand on my shoulder. All right, we prayed. I walked away. I was like, ah, oh, I prayed. I just prayed with somebody. I was all right. Do you remember that, Dean, at all? Do you? That's cool. You and Craig, too? Fellowship. Worship. Changing what you listen to. We talked on Wednesday night all about worship. Um, don't get the CD. You'll hate it. Listening to stuff that's edifying to your spirit and putting away stuff that is bad for it. Um, witnessing, sharing your faith. I've often said this. You've been walking with the Lord for five years or more, and have you ever led anybody to the Lord? Have you ever had anybody say to you, can I have what you have? Would you help me? And you say to them, instead of inviting them to church, you invite them to the Lord. It's good to invite them to church, and I'm glad you do, but please don't do that until you've invited them to the Lord. Don't bring them here into false pretenses so that they go, I can't believe he just said that. Don't do that. Say, you know what? What you really need is the Lord. After you have the Lord, then, then we'll go to church. Invite them to the Lord. If you're walking with the Lord five years or more and you've never prayed with somebody to receive salvation, again, I'm asking you the question. You better check yourself. You better check your relationship with the Lord. I don't know. I mean, look, I'm looking around here. I see my brother Shane, my other brother Shane. Uh, I'm seeing JD. We got, these are jujitsu guys. These are guys I've been training with. We're jiu you don't got to hang out with us very long until the conversation turns to jujitsu. It won't be long at all. Oh, bro, did you see what uh, Marcelo did? Did you, did you see what? Did you see? It won't. Shark did this, and Rafi did this. And, I mean, this is what we talk about. So you walk up and you rewind, and you're like, I don't even understand the language you guys are talking about. Kimura, what, what is that? You, know, you will find very, very quickly, we really like jujitsu. Me and Bobby train together. Me and Alex train together every week, two, three times a week. We do things to each other that if you walked in, you'd be like, oh. <laughs> Bobby sweats more than any human being I've ever met. Aww. When you're training with him, beads of his sweat will roll off and hit you in your eyes and in your face. It's horrible. But at the same time, from a jujitsu perspective, it's beautiful. He's working, man. But he's respectful. He carries a rag everywhere he goes. But I want to ask you again, what about the Lord? How long does somebody have to be around you before they find out that you're a Christian? 
that you're a lover of Jesus Christ. Here's why people don't read the Word of God. And please, please, please buckle up. This is a really tough ride. People don't like to read the Word of God because they don't want nobody telling them what to do. And you know when you start reading the Bible, it's immediately going to mess with your sex and your money. And there's two things people don't like to have mess with in their sex and their money. But I'm going to ask you this question. How long were you mad at your parents until you found out that they had your best interest in mind? How long did it take you to realize? How old did your children have to be? How old did you have to be before you realized? Listen, I didn't have great parents from a, com from a perspective of parents. My parents were product of the 60s and the 70s. They were into free sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We were raised on the road. Um, and just so you guys know, I spent the first 13 years of my life living in the summers in a, in a nudist camp. That's how I was raised. It's, it was pretty, pretty horrible from, from a... a a how you don't raise a kid perspective. But let me tell you, now that my kids are growing up and I got little ones, I'm looking back a lot and I'm going, you know, I understand why they did a lot of the stuff that they did. Still a lot of stuff I understand that they shouldn't have done. I, you know, I'm not going to. But when I'm a perfect parent, that's when I'll start now judging my parents. But it took me some years to get to that place. Because here's one of two things that either happens in your lives, and you kids write this down in your brain. Number one, either you think your parents are the greatest things in the world and no matter what they do is okay, and that's bad. Or number two, you've gotten to that place where it inverts and now you hate them because everything they did to you is wrong. And you can't stand them, you don't want to talk to them, you don't want to be around them, everything they did. And the truth is probably closer to the middle where you're going to grow up and you're going to say, I'm glad they did that. I, there's so many things in my life now, I'm, I'm really glad. You know, if, the, if my father was an extremely, my father's Sicilian Italian, was Sicilian Italian, God rest his soul, and he was extremely violent, he'd hit us. You know what? But if the options were him hitting us or not hitting us at all, I think I'd take hitting us because it taught me discipline. I, I, I rather it like that. Matt, your dad was the same way, right? You guys didn't play. <laughs> Who got hit more, you or Bobby? Bob? <laughs> you said that right, I see that, I was knowing your question. Yeah, Bob. <laughs> and I think that so many of us avoid reading the scripture because you know what, the truth of the matter is, you have to the same place in your life get to. And I don't know where that is. I don't even remember where it is. I remember reading the Bible because I was told I had to, avoiding it as much as I possibly can, and then one day I absolutely fell in love with it. I said, this is the most amazing thing, I've, and I can't get enough of it. So I have committed my life to reading this thing every single day. Hours upon hours, over and over, sections of scripture that I've read literally dozens of times. Every time I read it, it seems to sparkle a new nuance, a, a, a diamond-like facet that goes off in my brain. I'm like, God, your word is amazing. I can't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow? Proverbs chapter 5. I can't wait to read it tomorrow. Now, the reason that happens isn't because I've given some gift and I'm a pastor. Listen to me. Do you want to overcome these sins that we've listed? The lust and the pride and the arrogance and the wrath and the eat. Do you want to overcome them? This power is in you. But if you don't plug into it, tap into it, if you don't train your jujitsu, if you're not working on your Muay mu Thai, if you're not conditioning, you're out of the game before you got. Now listen, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Savior you've been given the ability to be forgiven of your sins. That doesn't mean you're not going to sin. All that means is your original sin is forgiven. You are going to heaven, but you could still walk around just as burdened as any non-believer 
your relationship with God blocked up. You can't hear him. He can't hear you. Your relationship with your family and friends completely shot because you don't utilize the one tool that is the greatest thing that's been given to you. The one prayer that God always says yes to. 1 John 1, 9. If you ask, you're forgiven. Why should I have to ask if I've already been forgiven? No, no, no. You've been given the ability to be forgiven over and over again. Well, if I've been given the ability, then I'm not really forgiven. Yes, you are. That doesn't make any sense. It makes sense if you want it to make sense. And the sense is this. You have been forgiven of your original sin. Thus, as a Christian, you are going to heaven. But you're continuing living your life in these little sins that are keep peppering your life and ruining your relationships and ruining your jobs, killing your finances and doing this. If you don't ask God to forgive you of them, let me tell you something. Powerless. I don't know if any of you guys ever watch any MMA matches or are you flipping through the channels and every once in a while you see this guy with this giant big fat belly walk in and he walks in and you're like, <laughs> and you're like, yeah, this guy's a fighter? Tell me. And he comes out there and he throws his hands like this and all of a sudden he gets knocked out and he's on the floor upside down. I was like, well, you could tell by looking at him. He shouldn't have been in a cage to begin with. Now there are some exceptions, but we're not talking about those. We're talking about guys who are training for what they are going to be doing. And first and foremost to me, I want to be trained and ready for this life. I want to be trained and ready for this life. I want to be a darn good husband. I want to be a great father. I want to be an excellent pastor to you people. And I only know one way, one way to do that. And that's not by reading the latest self-help book, The Best You Today. It's by spending time with God, by reading his word, by sharing my faith with those that don't have any faith. It's by worshiping God, hands up, flat out, surrounding my brain and my heart. That's it. That's it. If you've not come to the terms of your life with God and you still hate your parents, because they, you haven't figured out. They had your best interest in mind. They might not have done everything right, but goodness sakes. You want to know what the hardest thing about being a pastor is, guys? Can I share some inside baseball with you here? You know what the hardest thing about being a pastor is? Here you go. You ready? My job is to help people. I help them fight against the world. I help them fight against the devil so that their relationships are repaired, restored, so that they're sober, some of them alive. And you want to know what the biggest battle is? They hate you for it. Because you tell them that they have to do something they don't want to do. I'm sitting here, and some of you guys are sitting here saying, oh, great, now i got to read the Bible every day. Now i got to go to church every week. Or just because you went. No, you don't. I don't care what you do, but don't complain to me when crap goes bad in your life. Actually, I didn't really mean that. Do complain to me. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you flat out the truth. I, listen, things are going bad in your life because you're not spending time in the Word. You're not going to church. You're not worshiping God. You're surrounding yourself with junk music, junk people. You're not fellowshipping with brothers. We haven't seen you. Any of the men's stuff. You got a, a, a busted up marriage? We have a, a, a marriage couple's ministry every week, uh, every month. You ain't going. What do you want me to do? Oh, wait a second. I think I got my magic wand here somewhere. Here it is. Here it is. There it is. I'll turn the light on. Ah, ah, your lives are all perfect now. There you go. Oh, you don't have to read the Bible. Don't worry. Here. Okay, here's where we close. Last thing. We're going to start our study next week in the book of Luke. We're going to look at the life of Jesus Christ and all of the things that he accomplished. Luke is the exact opposite of Mark. Luke is the most detailed out of all of them. It's the longest out of all the Gospels. It is complete and replete with everything that technically and medically, physically, the Lord Jesus went through. You're going to love it. But the last question is, 
Why do we study the Word of God? Well, we knew to tap into that power, but I wrote three things down in my Bible, and I want to read them to you. The first is to know the truth. The second is to nourish our spirit. And the third, and most important, that we haven't covered is so that heaven is real and we don't fear death. Hey, do you know that all you guys are going to die? You're all going to die. Every one of you here is going to die. And I can't tell you when. Might be sooner than later. Some of you might leave here and die. You might get hit by a car. You might get into an accident. Somebody might go into a store and shoot you. Huh? It can happen. You might. And the enemy has got us all so fearful. We're so afraid we're going to get sick. We're so afraid something's going to happen. We, we need cameras and we need film. I need my thing. I fall and I can't get up. We, we're so afraid of everything that is going to befall us or could befall us. And the simple reason is we're not spending enough time with God in the Word to know that His power is greater and mightier so that no matter what happens, it all is working together for good to them that love God, to them are called according to his purpose. He is greater in you who is in this world. I am with you always, even to the end of the age, the Bible says. To him belongs escapes from death. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Fear involves torment, but perfect love casts out all fear. If you know these things and believe that this is the word of God, think about those three, those, those, those three words, the word, four words, the word of God. This is the word of God. The God who flung the stars into space, the God who spoke your kid, you that are parents and grandparents here, into existence. The very fibers, very hairs on your children's head. If you're sitting next to your kid right now, I want you to turn around and look at their hair. Look at the color of their hair. Look at the beauty. If you're next to your, your, your wife, I want you to reach over and, or your brother, I see you're looking at your, your uncle, there he is. I want you to look. God painted that so that when you see somebody else who has that type of color, you're like, man, oh, oh, I, I thought that was my wife. It, that's God. And the word of God is in your hand. It's in your hand. And it's real and it's true and it wants to wreck the enemy. It wants to pull people out of the pit of hell. It wants you to have zero fear. That you must know you are, what's the word? Help me. Ah! I hate it. I had such a good moment there. Let me come back to it. When you can't die, immortal. He wants you to know that you are immortal until he says otherwise. And it is all ordained by him that if you get killed, you're only better. But we don't walk around like that, do we? None of us do. Oh, I found a bump on my arm. Oh, look at that thing. I think it's a tumor. I'm going to go to the hospital. Hold on. Can I get that tested? Does it bother you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the doctor said if I get that taken out, I wouldn't be on the mat for three weeks. So there's no way it's going to happen. That's how crazy jujitsu is. You're going to take it out? Yeah. You're going to train for me too? Well, no. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Guys, please fall in love with your Bible. Okay, what time is it? How long have I been going? How long have I been going? Have I been going now already? Holy crap. Okay, we got to finish. We'll talk more about this next week. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and ask you to bless us, God, with the hunger and thirst that your word talks about. And I pray over your congregation, your people, 
Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. May we hunger and thirst for your word, an unquenchable hunger, to know your word from beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, Lord Jesus. May the power of your word flow through us, and may those of us here that have had bad experience reading or just hate being told stuff, God, break that from us. May we reach out and touch the hem of your garment and receive the power of the hunger of your word that we would know um, 